afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge. My name is Jenna Labore, and I will be your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Kenan's trial philosophy, The Cutting Edge. Those of you joining us live this afternoon have the opportunity to ask questions and interact with our speaker. And I encourage you to do that today because we're going to have kind of a live demonstration. And so it's really going to lend itself nicely to being able to ask questions of Clayton while he's talking about his awesome topic today. If you have a question, please type it into the comments section below and we will be sure to address it. Episodes are released each week following the live broadcast, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and click the alerts icon so you don't miss an episode. As I mentioned today, we have Clayton Seifert back with us talking about the silent million dollar opening statement. And I know as much as you know about this, so I am excited to learn more. Clayton is coming to us out of Florida where he practices personal injury law. We had him and his law partner, Doug Dykes, on the show a year ago talking about their superstar verdict. So we know he is a trusted source on the topic of opening statements. We'll put his contact information in the description below. So if you have questions about this opening statement or anything Edge, you are able to send him an email and ask him about that. Clayton. Tell us about this silent million dollar opening statement. I mean, you just sit there and, and don't say anything. You have some, do you act it out? Tell us about it. Uh, well, Jenna, thanks for having me on the show. Obviously a pleasure and a privilege. Um, you know, openings are interesting um, and they're very different. Every case is very different. This is one that we worked on, we did a PowerPoint, and <clears throat> part of our theory was jurors, we, we don't believe that jurors really care about what the lawyer has to say. <laughs> um, so our goal with the opening, uh, and this is from a trial that we took to verdict in January, um, and the, the result was a $1.2 million verdict. Um, and remind me, Jenna, to tell you after this, uh, during the podcast, of what happened during our trial that really cost us a few million dollars. So uh, the listeners uh, don't have the same problem. It wasn't anything we did. It's something the juror did. But anyway, the, the point of the opening was um, let the jury see the facts and try to lead them down the path we want to without influence from the lawyer. So... If, if they came up with their ideas themselves, they'd be more trustworthy. And I do like that idea. Some people like this opening, some people don't. I'm intentionally not telling anybody the facts of the case, but I'm going to let you kind of be like the jurors. So the jurors didn't really hear much about it either, other than it was an auto and a pedestrian case and a personal injury claim, um, and that's kind of it. But um, if you're ready, I'm going to try to, pull it up on my screen and share the screen. Now then I will not hardly say a word. I will pause between slideshow slides, PowerPoint slides, and give the audience time to look at each slide. Some they read, some they don't, it's visual, but I'm here, <laughs> but I'm not saying much. I'm gonna do it just like we did in the trial and y'all tell me what y'all think, you know, you, everybody's opinion is important. So it's all right with you. I'm going to go ahead and try to start this. Go for it. All right. Yeah. For audience members who are on the elliptical or who are driving, please pull over to a safe place and pause your running for a moment and watch this one. It's a little bit less, it lends itself a little bit less to listening than some of our other episodes. Okay. One thing that I'm not real clear on is I do want to, uh, see okay here we go you got 101 on, on your screen Jenna? yeah i see it yes okay um this was part of the verbal part 101 pedestrians on bay county roadways are struck by a vehicle every year 101 is 101 too many
So this is our client, Andrea. This is video footage of the crash from a security camera.
Okay, that's the end of the PowerPoint. And Jen, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through the rest of the opening, which is oral. Okay. Yes, please. So this is what we told the jury. Um, now, let me tell you the story of what happened here. A college student here in Panama City on spring break, Mr. Pekarski, is going to admit to this jury that he's responsible for the crash that injured Andrea, a pedestrian but he has refused and continues to refuse to pay full and fair compensation for her injuries. You saw a picture of Andrea. I'm her attorney. The violation of the simply safety rule that has resulted in Ms. Reese having no choice but to seek accountability and justice for serious and life-threatening changes and injuries from you, the jury. If you only remember one thing, 101 preventable pedestrian injuries or deaths in Bay County is 101 too many. Now, the defense attorneys in this case have some excuses as to why they should not have to pay all the damages Andrea Reese's doctor says she needs. Their first excuse is that Ms. Reese is simply not that hurt that bad. After all, she's able to work in finance, a job that requires her to be intelligent and work at a high level. Some early on Norwegian, our clients from Norway, Norwegian records don't find much other than a lesion in her brain. They will say, how can a brain damaged person hold such a high finance job? What they will not tell you is that Andrea Reese works more hours than almost everyone else in her office just to keep up. Rather than celebrate the effort it takes her to succeed, they use it as an excuse to avoid paying full and fair compensation. Secondly, they'll tell you that when Andrea Reese returned to Norway, where she currently lives, she was raped. And she was, unfortunately. Therefore, all of her emotional issues are not really from her serious injuries that caused her as a result of being hit by the car, but are only from being raped. We spoke to the people who know Andrea Reese best, and they will talk to you about that during this trial and how that's simply not true. This brings us to the last question, question, and that is why? Why are we here? Why would the defendant admit responsibility and then refuse to pay full compensation for the injuries he caused? I would suggest you look in a few places. Did the defendants have any real doctors examine Andre Reese 
in order to understand her injuries before coming to trial? Did they speak to her employer in Norway in person or by Zoom to understand her work history? Or did they think they could bring their client to court and say he admitted to fall and knew the jury would cut him a break without any real evidence? After asking these questions throughout this trial, I believe the answers will become obvious. If you remember one thing, 101 preventable pedestrian injuries or deaths is too many. And so that was basically our opening. Um, the real problem with the case, Jenna, was Andrea, I mean, she was a hard worker. Uh, she got through college, it slowed her down two full years. She had a year of real bad depression and headaches, but she managed to get through it. And she um, got a job, got her master's in Norway, got a job at PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is one of the top world accounting firms. And she does work very hard. We had no medical bills because Norway has socialized medicine and they covered all our medical bills in the United States. And so our case was only past and future pain and suffering and future medical. And um, we picked our jury and we, we liked our jury. Uh, before trial, the defense would never offer seven figures. In fact, uh, when we filed suit, I think they offered us about 250K. Before trial, they offered maybe half a million. During the trial, the highest I think they offered was about seven, maybe 750. Um, anyway, we picked the, the jury here in Bay County. We liked the jury, and we, we had two jurors on there we really liked. And, and for those listening, I, Everybody's got their own opinion, but we like happy jurors for plants because happy people want other people to be happy. Miserable, depressed people don't want anybody to be happy and they don't want to give them anything and they want them to be just as miserable in life as they are. So we had six people at an alternate. Two of the jurors were parrot heads which are Jimmy Buffett fans. They knew each other and they were very happy people. And one of them was going to be our foreman. We knew it. He had a couple millennials. They don't care. And one really old overweight gentleman who probably didn't care. And we had one hater on there, which was, we call them haters, but she was a middle aged woman that either was divorced or never married, no children. She, was in, she, she also was in accounting, and you could just tell that she was probably not a very happy person, but we figured with one of them versus two happy people, we were okay. Trial was going great. We had eight expert witnesses we flew through. We had eight or nine people testify by Zoom from Norway live flew through, the, the witnesses were live, ex, eight experts. We had orthopedic surgeon, we had pain management, uh, we had a physiatrist, we had an economics expert, uh, besides his life care player, he's the same guy. We had um, a psychiatrist and a neuropsychologist, all testified live except for the finance guy, he appeared by Zoom. And, uh, Picked the jury on Monday, did our openings on Monday, started with witnesses Tuesday morning. Got through all 16 or 18 of our witnesses and our plaintiffs by Thursday midday. But during the cross-examination of our orthopedic expert, the guy that we thought was going to be the foreman, looked at the defense attorney and did this. <laughs> Made a slashing move with his hand. Uh, and the defense lawyer saw it. And so at break, the defense lawyer goes to the judge, like, Judge, that juror threatened me. Because he didn't threaten him. But so the judge said, Well, let's continue like we're doing. There's cameras in the courtroom. We'll pull the tapes, we'll look at it, and we'll have a hearing in the morning, which is Friday morning. Sure enough, 
We pull the cameras, the judge looks at it, and, and this guy that was our favorite juror had indeed done this motion. Mm. So uh. our best result was him getting kicked off. Of course, it was probably a mistrial, but actually, in hindsight, we should take a mistrial. So what happened is they bring in the alternate. Well, the alternate was a witch. Mm. I mean, a real witch, like practiced Wiccan. Like a Wiccan? Yeah. Yeah, she's a Wiccan. Okay. Yeah. She's a miserable person, and she did not want anyone else to be happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't want her client to get money. So now you got two haters on the jury, and you're left with this one happy person, and then three that don't really care. So we get the case to the jury, to the jury Friday evening about 5 o'clock. And they come back with a verdict about nine, and it was one point two million. And, and the foreman was our happy person. And when they, the judge pulled the jury, she noticeably hesitated and almost didn't agree with the verdict, but she finally did. So Saturday morning, I mean, one point two was more than they'd ever offered me. I, you know, we wanted a lot more than that, but you know, they, you know, we it was a good verdict, but we wanted more. And so Saturday morning, I get a note from my office that the guy that got kicked off the jury called me. And so I called him, and he was beside himself. First off, Friday morning, when the judge kicked him off, he, we told him, the judge told him he was the alternate. So, oh, okay, so they didn't say why. Yeah, so we, one thing we had to figure out is, did anybody see it? Yeah. So we didn't want anybody, so we just said, hey, Mr. So-and-so, thank you for your service. We really dismissed him early, but jurors probably don't know his last day of trial. You're the alternate. Thanks for your service. Well, he kind of knew that he got in trouble because when I talked to him, I told him, I said, well, here's why he got kicked off. He's like, man, I kind of figured that. But anyway, so he was furious at the verdict. He wanted about $5 million. And um, he said, look, the foreman is not happy with the verdict and she wants to call you. And I said, well, I cannot call her. If she wants to call me, she can. So she did. And um, I don't know if y'all know what a quotient verdict is, but I did not know until we had this come up. But a quotient verdict is where the jurors, if six jurors or how many you have in your state, they take all their numbers, add them up, and divide by six. Huh. That is not a unanimous verdict. That's okay. an average verdict. Yeah. And so that's absolutely grounds for a new trial. Uh, well, that's what they did. They couldn't agree. The Wiccan, so the foreman said she felt the verdict should be about five million. Some other people said in the millions. But the Wiccan, when she walked into the jury deliberation room, said, no way I'm agreeing to anything over a million dollars or close to it. First thing out of her accordance, because the foreman tells us it. Mm -hmm. Do you have and, a unanimous requirement? Sorry? Do you have a unanimous requirement? Or is it well, like it's, yeah, it's supposed to be a unanimous verdict. They're all supposed to agree on it. Like, okay. It's one thing to go in and everybody give their number, but then if they talk about it, they come around and like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'll agree to, you know, whatever number. Mm -hmm. They couldn't agree to it. So the one hater who was the accountant that we knew was on the jury, she said, well, let's just add up everybody's number and divide it by six. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we found that out, we filed a motion for a new trial, which is actually set for a hearing Tuesday next week. Okay. Um, but the, the jury basically, um, the foreman and the guy that got kicked off, both thought it should be around 5 million. And the foreman wrote that in her affidavit. Hmm. So, you know, that juror, he felt terrible. I said, I told him, I said, man, you cost me more money than anybody I've ever dealt with in my life. Cause literally he, you know, he cost us three or $4 million on the verdict. And, yeah. you know, maybe, uh, maybe, although who knows how it would have ended up with two. That's true. It would have been more yeah. because I learned a lot about jury dynamics. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You, you usually have, a few people that are really for you or against you. And then you got a group of them that really don't care. Well, if you get two that are really for you, three that don't care, and one that doesn't like you, 
you're going to win that case because mm -hmm. the two that are really for you are going to sway the other three and the sixth person will give up generally. Mm -hmm. In this case, we had that until he got kicked off. And that happy juror, she fought really hard, but eventually the, the two millennials, young guys, kind of went with the two girls that were close to their age, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was fairly attractive. You know, they just kind of got them on their side. Mm -hmm. The older guy, he goes, my wife's waiting to get out back, so I really need Oh, to my God. Oh, my God. I know that. I've heard that before. I had to get to something. I'm like, oh, yeah. really? Did you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this case would go on. I mean, we have- Were you shocked that it came back so quickly? I mean, four hours is- it's like no, when you're a criminal defense lawyer, like, well, my client's going to prison, you know? Well, no, I mean, two to four hours is about right. We fed them, and we figured after they eat, they're going to give us a verdict. Mm -hmm. And that guy ordered a big, huge steak we paid for, and then uh, he had to get out back to get another one. Oh, man! <laughs> I know. But anyway, so um, we'll see what happens. Okay. So... so <laughs> Let me stop there to see if you got any questions. So with that process, do you have editor motions so the court can kind of look at things? Because um, I know defense counsel always, when we have a good verdict, files a motion for remitter, uh, asking the court to reduce the amount. I don't know if you have that or if it's just a straight up, we want a new trial slash appeal. You can, but I don't think there's grounds for it. I mean... But there's a Florida Supreme Court case that on point says if you've got a quotient verdict, you get a new trial. Okay. And so, that's in Florida or that's like U.S. Supreme Court? Florida is Florida. Florida. Okay. I have to look at that because well, we we had juror misconduct in one of our recent trials, but the, the client wouldn't let us do anything. She was just like done with the process. But um, okay. So a few things about the opening. Who helped you with your illustrations and, and animations? Keenan, I mean, that, uh, what's his that? name? Um, I forgot. I was gonna say they kind of look a little bit familiar, but oh god, oh, oh, now I feel awful. I'll yeah, he, their animator over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was this a referral referring case? Blake Swanson. Blake, Blake, Blake. That's right, right, right. So yes, I a lawyer, I mean, like I get paid like less than everybody in this case. Um, mm -hmm. a lawyer referred it to me mm -hmm. and then I got to talking to Mindy Bish about it and Mindy liked the case. Mm -hmm. And so the, what made the case for everybody was the security camera footage. Yeah. That was, um, that was like shocking. I mean, like people's yeah, lives everybody and everybody. Watch that. I mean, we have people that verbally scream or gasp when they see that it's a very yeah. common reaction um and when you see how banged up she was in the hospital you know and she's just a beautiful girl and and then unfortunately she gets raped i mean it was a crazy case god a poor thing and a lot of weird facts and it was 2015 mm -hmm. so it's been eight years mm -hmm. but we had hurricane michael which was a cat five hurricane hit us in 2018 which destroyed our office that slowed us down and of course we had COVID and so I mean the case kept and it had a bunch of experts and anyway um learned a lot trying the case um you know learned brevity but also learned that uh you know just most of the stuff you put so much faith in doesn't matter those people in that box they come there to, they you know that that Wiccan chick she had decided Long ahead, she wasn't giving anybody money. You could have put a dead baby on the table in front of her and yeah. been like, life happens, you know? Yeah, I just opened up a memo because I've really taken to heart doing a post-case memo on every client, and that was that's directly attributable to Edge and Papa Don. Um, and I opened up my memo from a trial I had last year just while you were talking and added a little thing saying, pick happy jurors because... The t there were two very strong, one, one the four person who were miserable people, men in their 30s, which we knew that they were, were going to be bad, but we, we have a 12 person jury over here. So there's only so many people you can get rid of who are not men in their 30s in a tech town yeah. like Seattle. <laughs> so, right. um, and it absolutely, and that's just something that, you know, for folks listening, 
you know, these just these little things that may seem inconsequential, but could absolutely tip the scales in your favor. Mm -hmm. Being a happy person is one of them because you are absolutely spot on that if I'm a miserable person and I get on your jury, I want you to be miserable. I definitely don't want you to get millions of dollars, <laughs> whether it's because I'm punishing you, the lawyer, or because I'm punishing you, the plaintiff, or because I'm just a, you know, nasty person. So they're just, they're just not, you know, they're like, we're a very Republican conservative state or air County, a lot of military. And, um, you know, they, there's a lot of people I'll get rid of during Vordar that, that won't award pain and suffering. They'll say, mm -hmm. you know, they'll say, well, I'll give you money for your medical bills or your lost wages, but I don't think you should make money off a lawsuit. Yeah. And you can get them kicked, but some of them won't be that obvious. Yeah. Um, i tell you a trick. Another old lawyer told me he got it. Well, he, and he got it from another old lawyer. He said, I picked jurors with comfortable shoes. Oh, interesting which wait because they're like there for the long haul because they're like practical well, they're just, no. you know they're just happy people they're they're wearing comfortable shoes and they're comfortable people mm -hmm. but that woman that was the finance you know the the single divorcee with no kids she had on these stiletto high heels every day and we we're like yep uh -oh. now the, the wiccan did she even wear shoes i don't know <laughs> She was, and, and what was crazy was we didn't think she was that bad, but boy, she, she sure was. She, uh, I've had that with other jurors before I had a, a trial, um, what much, it was sm much smaller case, but state farm case, they'd offered us like 70 or hundred policy. We got a verdict for about 300. Mm -hmm. It was a shoulder surgery. And after the trial, about a month or two, I ran into the foreman, this, this mm -hmm. lady, and, and, um, she was a happy person and she said, yeah, there's men that won't give your client nothing, but she got in there and basically made them do it. And, but she was a happy person. Now then I'll tell you another thing that, that I, I don't like in with jurors. I don't want a juror that has had, or is close to an injury like mine. So like if my client's got a low back problem, I don't want a juror with a low back problem because that person will say, well, nobody gave me any money. Yeah. And I just deal with my back injury. Mm -hmm. and I don't whine about it. I don't cry yeah, about it. <laughs> that's that's the same thing. Yeah. And I used to think the opposite, but I had a jury trial year before last, got a $1.4 million verdict on it. And um, the, I, I left on there this lady that had this, that was on disability. And she was one of the ones against me. And I thought she'd be great because she had a bunch of health problems. Cause I thought she'll get by there and tell them how this stuff just gets worse. I had a fairly young guy that got hit by a forklift out of the port. Mm -hmm. And he looks okay now, but I was saying, Hey, 10, 20 years from now, he might not be able to walk. Well, she basically, I think looked at it like, well, I'm way worse off than him. And all he's got to do is lose some weight. And so I don't like jurors that have a, the same or a similar injury, but in this case, we just tried the defense. They thought we did. So they kicked some of them off and it, with their preemptories, which we were happy mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I don't know what, what, what are some of the things you like about or don't like about jurors? That's my worst skill, actually, if I had to say. I, I just am terrible at it. I think I feel I, and this is another thing that I've learned, but still have yet to get very good at putting into practice, is feeling like my case will convince anyone. If it's a strong case, the jury will get it. And that's just not true. That's just flat out not true. You really do have to, you know, pick. I mean, we do try to stay. It's It's hard. I mean, and I see Dave Crump's question, so Dave, I'm coming to you. But um, it is hard. Um, I would say 95% of the trials we do are in King County, which is a very, it's a very liberal, um, elite, affluent county for the most part. Um, very uh, tech oriented. Very finance. Um, CE, you get CEOs. You get neurosurgeons. You get just a type of person and they are to a person miserable 
angry and they don't believe anything anybody says to them. So skeptical, I guess, would be the third thing. And it's very, um, it's frustrating because you you look through the, as, as of COVID, we've been able to get a list of jurors like, the week before, because now we, most of the time, even still, we're doing at least jury selection uh, remote. And so they'll give us a big, it'll be like, you know, 50, um, 75 people. And they all have these traits. And so it's, it's very hard. It's really, really hard. Um, I think looking at things like shoes or someone who seems to be happy or things like that are things that we're going to have to look at more than what do they do for work? Where do they get their news? What are their political leanings? Yeah, what are their, you know, and standard questions are such BS. Yeah, uh, I, I do think overall, you want to try to find a happy juror, and it's like poker. You're not, you're not gonna. Nobody's that great. I mean, I'm sure Mr. Keenan's, you know, like the best. I'm just mm-hmm. never gonna get there. But as a general rule, I think you're happy people are going to be better. Did you have a question we need to answer? Yeah. So Dave Crump out here from my neck of the woods asks, what did you do to spread the tentacles? In the opening, I didn't hear much about the driver. Did the judge cut that out? Let me tell you something. Uh, we have a hard time spreading tentacles around right here because they don't like it. And in fact, in this case, as we said, it was admitted liability. So they wouldn't even... The judge didn't even let me use a statistic. Mm. Um, what I would do, uh, you know, and, and the tentacles is one that I struggle with, um, trying to spread it. You could try and, like, during the board hour, we would ask, you know, um, you know, how many people walk to work or does anybody walk one way or the other and sort of making the point of, our client now is scared every time she crosses an intersection as a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And so it could have hit anybody, you know, it could have been other people on the beach, um, other tourists, other workers, but the judge really limited us. And the single piece of advice I'm going to tell you listing is if you've got stuff you want to use in your opening, that is questionable of it coming in. It's not specific medical records, like statistic. You need to get it in front of the fence early. Like one of the best things I did was I had two of our experts, basically they saw this entire PowerPoint and we got attached to their deposition and they went through slide by slide and sort of agreed with every part of it. Well, 90% of that the judge let in because they'd seen it all. If you got something that you bring to trial and the defense hadn't seen it, even if it's just an illustration, my experience is unless you got this phenomenal judge, it's really good, good for you is they're not going to let it in. And so get it in early, which is hard to do because a lot of times we don't think about things until late in the case, but get your expert at least to talk about as many things in your opening and think about these factors that you want to have in your opening early enough that you can get them in with your expert depot. Because otherwise, I, the judges just shut me down. They're like, no. Yep. Um, I don't know that I exactly answered this question, but uh, it was tough. It's tough spreading the tentacles of danger. Some of those things are just tough to get in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you... So you had, well, I mean, it's admitted liability, right? That's another thing that creates a problem of really talking much about the the driver, <clears throat> kind of what. Well, yeah, when they did that, we had a punitive damages claim, but the judge threw that out. And because um, the kid had been awake for 27 hours and because uh, he drove down here from Indiana and he just never slept. You know, we had no evidence he was on drugs, although I think he was on Adderall or something like that, but nobody ever tested him. So we didn't get to talk about it. And, you know, we, we worked on this opening and, and when they admitted liability, I couldn't talk about any of it. I mean, his old depot was all the things he did wrong and they want to focus on the defendant. Well, we didn't get to, you know, and so middle liability cases are tough on that issue. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super tough. And I, I don't, there is a college course. It was called missed. And now I think it's called admitted liability um, with edge and there's some, and you know, very helpful stuff in the college course. But it is a very, and you know, Dave um, 
who asked the question in the first place. We, he knows in Washington, we they don't even wait until the end or right before trial. They admit liability right out the gate because they are just like, why would we not do that? It's so beneficial to us. And so something yeah. we see a lot, um, especially in your kind of car crash cases. Um, sometimes even in, like, I think our... I think our tractor trailer case with that we were referring attorneys with Papa Don were was also admitted liability. Yeah, the corporation didn't care. They were like, "Yep, it happened." So let's talk about damages, and they were like, "Oh, okay," you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't you, you can't really get the jury mad at the defendant. And our defendant was a young kid who was uh, probably on the spectrum, really smart kid, but clearly had. A lot of anxiety issues and so he's sitting there where he our courtroom was small and he was about eight feet from the closest juror and he was like when we showed that video we showed her pictures he he started shaking and crying oh, oh see look i just felt bad for him oh and his God. mother was in the courtroom with a shaved head because she's going through chemo oh come on and she was oh. a defendant also so there was some empathy for them but we yeah. addressed that we said look you know, we 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 understand that this is hard on them, but it's hard on us too. And and one thing I told the jury in closing that I thought was very good is I said, you know, we tried to focus on the fact this is not an award. You're not, and I, I said you're not determining how much money our client gets or how much the defendant pays. Mm -hmm. You're only determining what damages are. Mm -hmm. Judge decides who pays or who gets what, if anything, mm -hmm. but you know, you're not deciding who pays what and uh, tried to get them back on track of don't feel sorry for the kid, but they still yeah. thought about it, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's always going to be there. And I think they, I mean, without us being able to say, I don't know, I've turned this over in my head so many times, how to say they're not paying it without saying they're not paying it. And, and then I think, well, why couldn't I say they're not paying it? Because all the rule says is that you can't say insurance. So maybe. I think you can. We got it. We, we really tried hard and yeah. made, made it clear. You're yeah. not. I, and I, if I was going to do the next case I do, next trial, I'm going to do, I'm say at the beginning, you're not going to decide who pays what or who gets what. Mm -hmm. You're deciding an amount of damages as a result of an injury. Yeah. So um, get that early on because they do have empathy for defendants. The trial we had before this one um, at the port, we sued the forklift company and then the driver. Well, the jury came back with a question that said something to the effect of, uh, does he have to pay this? Well, they felt sorry for the driver. Yeah. I should have let him go. But he yeah. was such a terrible, he lied so bad um, that... I was like, no way. And he basically admitted it was his fault on stand, but the jury still felt sorry for him. I should have not had him on the verdict form. I should have just had the company on the verdict yeah. form. Yep. Yeah. These all these things that you learn, right? You're like, okay, next time this is kind of what I'm gonna do. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we had a juror say one time, actually it was the foreman, and he said, Yeah, we believed your client was injured, but we just didn't feel like they should have to pay that much. And I couldn't tell. I mean, I didn't ask him too much follow-up because I was just like Ugh, about it, but um, I didn't. I couldn't tell if he meant that the individual defendants should not have to pay, like he believed they would have to pay, or if he just didn't think anybody should have to pay that much. I mean, looking back on it, if I had been quicker on my feet, I would have been like, oh, so you felt bad for the insurance company. Okay, noted, moving on. And then he would have been like, wait, what? And because afterwards, after the fact of like friggin', oh, it's all off the table. The rules are off the table. I'm going to tell you. Well, yeah. I tell you, in um, in the focus groups I do, this shocked me, but the majority of people out there think that the cases that have insurance settle, and when there's no insurance, those cases go to trial. Ah, okay. You do a focus group, ask them. Majority of them will say, well, we figure the ones that where there's insurance, they just settle. Because, you know, insurance companies will pay you just to go away, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's what people I, think. Yep. And then you got those individual defendants sitting there shaking and crying yeah. with their cancer, with all these things that are going on. And it, it is very misleading. And I, I actually, I chickened out and I'm going to just admit this straight up. I had a plan to ask um, 
the judge to not allow the defendants to be on camera. It was a Zoom trial. I was going to ask if they're going to be there, but they have their camera off. And I chickened out. I didn't do it. I wish I had done it um, because I, and my argument was going to be, it's playing to the sympathies of the jury. You know, we all know these people are not paying this. And the more they sit on camera and the jury bonds with them as much as they're bonding with everybody else, it creates problems. So someday I hope I have the cojones to, to do that. And we'll see. I'll probably get denied. But I'm curious to try it out. So I don't know what you yeah, think. About that. Trial, they get to see it. I'll tell you one other thing that happened. And the, the foreman told us that they really like this. Mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of defense lawyers do that. In, in Florida, you get in closing plaintiff gets to do closing, then the defense gets to do closing, and plaintiff gets a rebuttal. That's mm -hmm. the end of it. So in the defendant's closing, he said, well, give her about 600000 basically. He said, that's fair. Mm -hmm. He said, and he goes, that seems like a lot of money. He goes, I would take that. And so I took that as an opportunity to get as close to the golden rule violation mm -hmm. as you can without doing it. And I got up and I screamed at the guy, and I said, what a joke. You would take 600. Would you give your daughter 600,000 to have that happen to her, your wife, anyone in your family? And I just kept going. I was waiting for the judge to stop me, but yeah. I was just like doing my best to get the jury going, wait a minute, would I take 600,000 for that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, and I literally turned at him and I was screaming at him. I said, this is an insult. This is, I can't believe you say that. Mm -hmm. And the foreman said that was her favorite part of the trial. Oh, okay. Nice. So you just learn different things in different trials. Mm hmm Absolutely. So a couple, we have a couple minutes left here. Um, for okay, so I want to go back to the opening. It, did you do it for us today the same way you did it for the jury? And so that the whole PowerPoint you were silent and they read it, or were, was there any narrative yeah, over it? Pretty much the same. I had co-counsel that hated the, the opening. Mm -hmm. Some people liked it. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, they said it's too long, too quiet, but I'll tell you the jury read it. I was standing at the side of the jury box running my PowerPoint and uh, they were reading it and looking at it. And I waited until basically they'd look at me and nod and go to the next slide. Okay. And the one that was a foreman read the most or going to be the foreman the one that got kicked off, mm -hmm. but they did read it. Okay. You know, instead of me telling them, that was the goal. They didn't seem to get bored with it. Okay. And even the medical stuff, you know, you weren't concerned that they wouldn't understand it, which actually is exactly what we should not be thinking and worrying about juries not understanding things. So what I just well, did there. Are they going to trust a lawyer to tell them? I mean, yeah. I do think some of it, you know, Mindy's idea was to do it silent. I think that some of it should have had an explanation. Like for, I mean, the intersection, everybody knows Bay County, mostly if you live here and they know where that intersection is. I'm sure the people watching this don't, but so I would have explained it. But for the most part, um, I kind of like it because it is taking the lawyer out. It's, it's the whole off code. You're off yeah. code. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was reading it and looking at it, looking at the pictures, looking at things. And, you know, um, it, it definitely was. I mean, if you make a PowerPoint and then you talk about it, it can be difficult for people to be listening and watching at the same time. So they're right. going to miss one or the other. Um, and did so I know uh, KLF does a bunch, Keenan Law Firm, they do um, uh, always do tons of focus groups. And, and all of us in Edge, we all do, all do focus groups. So what do the focus groups tell you about the PowerPoint? How did they help you shape that so that it was ready for the jury and uh, how, that it was effective? Um. Well, like with most trials, that thing didn't come together until, you know, like really the weekend before, but mm -hmm. the focus groups, uh, Lee, that's such a big question because I did so many focus groups on this thing. Um, i tell you one thing they did. I personally believe that this caused tribute to the rape because she was a very confident girl before this and, um, boys came to her naturally and she lost her self-confidence when she had the brain injury because she gained a bunch of weight. She had memory problems, light sensitivity, headaches. I mean, it really messed with her. Scar, beautiful girl. Now got scars on her face that aren't that severe. So 
it changed her personality. And so she was basically looking for love in all the wrong places. She went to a pretty sketchy bar, picked up a sketchy dude, went home with him and said, Hey, I want to leave. And he locked her in, in, in his apartment and raped her. And I don't think she would have been there, but the focus group, when I focus group that they were like, that's reaching too far. Uh -huh. So what I did was I made the defense think I was going to do that. And they filed this big old motion to exclude it. And I dropped it at the last minute, which had them focused on that. Mm -hmm. Not some other issues that I think they could have won had they focused on them, but they got so focused on the rate. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'll just drop that claim. Yeah, and, that makes sense. Because then it's almost like they're overreaching by saying the rape is causing all this stuff. And you're yes, not doing the same. It was an insult. It was really, I mean, the, the foreman was appalled by the idea. Um, but the Wiccan chick was like, oh, I think the rape probably did. You know, she, the, the, the haters are going to grab anything they can. Mm -hmm. but you're not going to change their mind. Yeah, that, I mean, that is, and it's the same with the happy people, which is great for us, right? We don't want them to change their minds. We want them to stay supportive of us, but either way, and that's something that I still need to learn better is that you cannot change people's mind, no matter how logical, objective, 100 proof positive evidence you show them, they have their thought, and that's just where they're going to kind of fall. I mean, you might have the not care people kind of who give up, you know, well, what you do to me is you give the the people that love your case evidence to sway the don't care people. Mm -hmm. right. And you try to keep the defense from getting evidence that's going to sway the haters, that's, that's going to help the haters out. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're, you're hopefully giving things that help your lovers that are going to bring people to your side. But, you know, there's safety in numbers, and we got outnumbered on that one when our Foreman got kicked off, so uh, crazy. Uh, Dave asks, did the BNA witnesses do well before and after witnesses? Um, how many did you have? What did you do? Had about eight of them. Had uh, mom, sister, dad. I stuck with the thi thing about trying to give one story. They were, you know, by 15 minutes, most of them. Some of them less than that. Uh, best friend who talked about how her total personality changed. I thought they did great. The, again, the thing was the haters just ignore all that crap. Mm -hmm. And they went and said, well, I think the rape probably did it. And, you know, she cried on the stand when Mr. Seifert questioned her, but she didn't cry that much when the defense questioned her. And she does have a great job and Norway's got free health insurance, things they weren't supposed to consider. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, that's jury selection is so damn important. Um, it really is. You know, I find that before and after witnesses, like if you, if the jury likes you or if you have jurors who like you, they will believe that before and after witnesses are powerful. If they don't like you, they're going to think that before and after witnesses have skin in the game, no matter who they are, a coworker, a family member, a friend, childhood friend, like whatever. It, it's just, they're going to receive the information um, through their lens and filter it the way that yeah. reinforces their view. That's true. Well, I do love trying to get a story. The dad told a powerful story about a conversation with his daughter where she cried for the first time after the car wreck before the rape, because she thought she wasn't going to finish school because of all her headaches. And, you know, she just wasn't as smart as she was. And, those stories are really powerful. And that's that's one thing that, you know, just get some facts in there, specific facts, not, well, she's just in the same person, you know, yeah. you stay away from that crap. Yep, absolutely. All right, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us again, Clayton. It was great to have you on. And thank you for all of you. Thank you to all of you who joined us for this week's episode of Fridays with Keenan's Cutting Edge. If you liked the episode, please give us a like by clicking up, clicking the thumbs up button to feed that YouTube algorithm. Let YouTube know that you find this content interesting and useful. Next week, I believe we have a replay of a previously aired popular episode, but I will see you back in a few weeks with one of my favorite folks, Mindy Bish. And I may be back in the meantime as well if we are able to get a live person on. So I look forward to the next time I'm able to be with you guys. Have a wonderful weekend and I will see you then.